In 1967, the American sociologist Robert Bella used the term civil religion in his classic article, Civil Religion in America. Bella proposed the existence of an American civil religion that overarches the, the diverse face of Americans expressing their common belief in America's special relation to God. However, for Bella, this civil religion is not a philosophical idea, but an empirical entity, observable from both politics and public attitude in the USA and in all other nations. Whereas civil religion in Bella's perspective usually is seen, seen as spontaneously created by society, Rousseau sees civil religion uh, as deliber deliberately created by the state. The tension between these two ideas of civil religion is important when trying to understand the policy of religion in Denmark. An illustrative example of civil religion in Denmark is this. On the first Tuesday in October, the Folketing, the Danish parliament, begins its session year. The Folketing's first meeting is initiated with a series of traditional ceremonies. Some of them are part of the constitution, while other traditions are part of the parliamentary protocol and the standing orders of the Folketing. The opening tradition merged the celebration of the nation state, the Folketing, the Danish democracy, and the dominant religion in Denmark, the Danish Evangelical Lutheran Church, in a series of rituals that exemplify a sacral church state ritual. The opening rituals of the Constituent Assembly in 1848 constitute the parliamentary opening rituals and have continued every year at the opening of the popularly elected parliament. A sermon has been part of the opening ritual since the opening of the Constituent Assembly in 1848. The last few years, politicians from both left and right has questioned the opening service of the parliament from a secularist, secularist, secularist perspective. In 2003, the Liberal Minister of Ecclesiastical Affairs chose the priest, Thomas Christensen, from the Inner Mission, uh, which is the largest revival movement within the Danish Evangelical Lutheran Church. The choice was questioned by the Liberal Party's spokesperson, or spokesman, Jens Rode, who informed the newspaper Politiken in October 2003 that it is simply too dark with Inner Mission. The opening of the Folketing is a day of celebration. In October 2007, a Muslim member of parliament, Kamil Qureshi, openly criticized the opening service and stated to the Danish news agency Ritzau that, I mean, you attend church on Christmas Eve, the mosque during the Ramadan, and the synagogue at the Sabbath. But for the opening of parliament, you go to the Folketing and not the palace chapel. If you want to keep politics and religion separated, then you do not begin the parliamentary year by going to the palace chapel. The chairman of parliament at that time, Christian Meidal from, from uh, the Liberal Party Venstre, defended the tradition and in the newspaper Nyhedsavisen on October stated, it is a splendid tradition and there is absolutely no need to change it. The dispute led to a public debate on whether the opening service was appropriate or not and the relation between religions and politics. In the same article, the clergyman and member of parliament for the Danish People's Party, Dansk Folkeparti, Jesper Langballe stated that Kureshi's contestation was nonsense and that Kureshi is Muslim, you see, and knows nothing about Lutheran Christianity. It is only in intellectual circles, in the editorial offices of the newspapers and among certain politicians at Christiansborg that people don't realize that church attendance is not a confusion of politics and religion. As Bertel Horter, at that time the Minister of Ecclesiastical Affairs, so beautiful has put it, in the palace chapel, we gather on what we agree about, and in the hall of the Folketing, we gather on what we disagree about. And again last year, when the Folketing opened, member of parliament uh, from both left and right openly questioned the opening rituals taking place in the palace chapel and organized a discussion session on politics and religion as an alternative to the opening service. This suggests that if the ritual's content becomes too religious, then it will be too controversial for many parliamentary members and they will not continue to participate in the tradition. Those, these traditions do not constitute civil religion anymore, but serve only as political religion. 
But already in the beginning of the 20th century, politicians from the Social Democratic Party and the Social Liberal Party explicitly questioned the opening service on several occasions during the parliamentary opening debates. For example, the prominent Social Democrat, Social Democrat Frederick Borbjerg on October 12, 1905 stated that it is bad enough that the confession-free parliament negotiations are opened with a service this parliament in which Christians, free thinkers, Jews and heathens can be seated, and I ask the Ministry of Ecclesiastical Affairs if it is not time to abolish this old and antiquated costume. As mentioned earlier, when the ritual become controversial, for instance, when the church gained power over the ritual or controversial, uh, controversial uh, persons got access to the uh, pulpit, it lost its effect as a civil religion and turned into a political religion. A characteristic the ritual in this period appropriately could be applied. After the first social democratic government in 1925 criticized the opening service, few thereafter criticized the first part, the sermon, of parliament's opening tradition. Given the government's influence, the Social Democrats chose to tone down their criticism of the state-church relation for a more pragmatic attitude toward the state-church relationship. This has been the dominant policy in ecclesiastical affairs since then. After this, the ritual was not discussed for several decades. It lost its position as a controversial issue, and the ritual was thus transformed into a civil religion until now. The opening ritual is a symbol of the close relationship between nation, and state and church in Denmark. The historical background for this arrangement points to the period of the Reformation when the church in the Nordic countries shifted from a papal to a principal church, following the principal cuius regio aius religio, uh, whose the region uh, is the religion. In other words, the religion of the king or or the ruler would be the religion of the people. This means that the king became the sumus episcopus and combined uh, in his person uh, the supreme ecclesiastical and state powers. And he became therefore both the symbol of the state as well as the religious head. This has been confirmed through rituals which involved the king, the national church, and the legisl legislative or consultative assemblies that existed before the constitution constitutive assembly in Denmark. The state's official and dominating religion with these means was legitimizing the state authorities, which also had the consequence that the state authorities had to control the state religion by integrating the dominating religion in the state juridical system. This is done through rituals such as the opening ritual examined before, and this shows that symbols and rituals are crucial to politics, but does not necessarily mean that the people simply view the world in the way their culture and its guiding myth dictate. What is crucial, though, is the fact that power must be expressed through symbolic guises. Symbolism is necessary to prop up the governing political order, as the American anthropologist David Kurtzer writes in his book Ritual, Politics and Power. In other words, it is important for the state authorities to show the people through rituals and symbols that they are legitimized by the dominating religion of the people or the dominating national ideology, for example, national myths. In this case, the constitution, parliament, or democracy, and the evangelical Lutheran church appear to be important components in the Danish national ideology. But how is this relationship articulated in the constitution? The evangelical uh, Lutheran church's position as the people's church or the state church and the king's belonging to, the, to this are written in the constitution section 4. The evangelical Lutheran church shall be the established church of Denmark and as such shall be supported by the state. And section 6, the king shall be a member of the evangelical Lutheran church. The church's official relation to the state is included in the constitution from 1849. Uh, with the constitution, the Danes obtained both freedom of religion and a state church. 
The Constitution gives the citizens full freedom of religion, as well as it makes clear that the Evangelical Lutheran Church is the Danish people's church, and as such should be supported or subsidized, as it's set in the Constitution by the state. The translation uh, differs from the above quoted section 4 in the Constitution. The first quote is the official translation from the Parliament's webpage, whereas the second quote is my translation of the same as section 4, which means Folkekirken, the Danish People's Church or the Danish Folk Church, in the official translation uh, as the Established Church of Denmark. The term established is not an accurate translation, and there is a point to this. The concept of the Danish folk church is only ascertained, which means that the Constitution Section 4 does not establish a new church called uh, the Danish folk church, but acknowledges that the existing evangelical Lutheran church, church is the church of which the majority of the population are members. Instead of the king as the head of the church with the Constitution from 1849, it was agreed that constitution of the established church should be laid down by statute. The consequence was that the legislatures attained power over the church. 